All right, everyone. Hello, it's me. I'm here now. I was just on Diamond Stream. Diamond, I see you raided the stream. Thank you for uh, sending everyone over to me. I, I do appreciate, uh, as always, getting to play in the game. So thank you, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm in charge. This is my ship now. So um, I wanted to have, oh my goodness, Vox, thank you so much for the follow. I appreciate it. Um, so the stream tonight, um, this is, we're going to cover a couple of things. So uh, those of you who were not aware, uh, I had a Cyberpunk Red Boot Camp that I ran for uh, about a week. It was a little over a week. It was Monday from uh, Monday of last week's, the 15th, to Monday of this week uh, running. I had scheduled two sessions every day except for the Mondays because I run my actual play here on the channel on those Mondays. Uh, Ohio, beautiful. <laughs> beautiful, Diamond. The Japanese from Duolingo is really, it's showing. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit and uh, I'm going to be uh, probably putting... Uh, an edited version of this VOD up later on YouTube as, as a video anyway, but I wanted to have uh, a little breakdown of what the last week has looked like for me, uh, how much sleep I lost, uh, and some takeaways. Um, and we're going to do some tier lists and stuff because I, I think that there's some fun stuff to be done with regards to the roles and stuff and how they kind of fit in. So, uh, <laughs> Ohio, there we go. There we go. Um, so yeah, so let's talk about the boot camp first of all. So um, in actuality, I ended up running, uh, I think it was two less sessions than I had planned for. Maybe three. Let me hold up. I can look at my folders. Uh, so I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, so I think I ran three less sessions than I thought I would um, by the end of the the whole thing. Um, because three mornings out of the, the boot camp, we just didn't have enough players. Um, which was fine, honestly. <laughs> um, I probably will do this again to some extent. Uh, I don't know that I will do it for quite as long next time. I don't know that I'll do quite as many sessions as I did next time. And the reason is because if any of you out there ever do want to do what I did, I highly, highly encourage you to consider all of the time you need to prep that many sessions of Cyberpunk because I was just going back to back to back most of the days. And uh, yeah, that was a lot. Um, even now, I'm not, I think, fully rested and got all my sleep back from all of that. Uh, it was it was a lot, um, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, that said, you know, it was a lot of work. I was exhausted. There were a couple mornings where I would show up to session and everyone at the table. I'd have to say, I'm so sorry. Please excuse my brain damage because I am not speaking clearly due to sleep deprivation. But um, all considered, it was fine. You know, like I think overall, I gave everyone kind of a good representation of what the game was. I got a lot of really positive feedback from pretty much every group that I ran through it. Um, even now, I'm still like I just before Diamond Session today got um a little bit of feedback from another one of the players um talking about how everything i did helped make the game easy to understand it was really atmospheric and like those are the things that i really try to center in on um but it was kind of interesting because with the knowledge of like what all i did during the boot camp um there was definitely a little bit of uh, an interesting like split for me of like, you had these players who really knew quite a bit about the game coming in. Like they had already taken the time and they've read the rule book or they 
had uh, watched other actual plays or they watched my actual play and they had gotten an idea for like what the world was and how it all worked. Um, or they were coming in and their only point of reference was 2077. So like that, I saw this a lot with Netrunners. So like Netrunners would come in and they would assume quick hacks were a thing. So uh, in the spirit of uh, producing something that I think could be helpful for future uh, boot camps and new players to the game in general, um, I wanted to go over, we're gonna do two tier lists um, and I'm gonna at the end of them explain what I think are the, the reasons that someone plays each role. Um, so to do this, uh, I have a tier maker tier list pulled up here. I may need a moment to make the second one because I was kind of uh, programming this during the session. Um, <laughs> don't get mad at me, Diamond. Um, but uh, I, I, I'm gonna start by saying all of these tier lists, they are my opinion. They are not endorsed by anyone. <laughs> Least of all RTG, I would hazard to guess. Uh, but I've gotten a little bit of this from discussions I've had with some of my players. And I want to pass it off to some of you, especially those of you in the audience who have GM'd a game of Cyberpunk. Because um, the first tier list we're going to do is going to cover uh, what I think is the, the GM effort tier list as it applies to every role. So to do that, uh, I'm going to have images of all of the role, um, the role pre-made characters from the single shot pack. So we're, we're going to go over kind of all of that. And we're going to, I'm going to give my opinion, chat, those of you who are GMs. So diamonds and any others in there that want to give, uh, an opinion by all means, your opinion is welcomed. I want to hear what it is. Um, so without any further ado, uh, let me go ahead and switch us over to the main monitor here. Just bear with me a moment while I vanish the Neon Inferno and... Alrighty, here we are. Uh, that is why it is called an opinion. Nomad. <laughs> All right, beautiful. So first of all, so let's, let's break down our tiers because I think, uh, I, I think that these are fairly appropriate tiers. So we've got, it just works. So basically if I could pick up a roll and I could take it out of the box and it doesn't require like any work on my end as a GM, other than to explain to the player what everything it does is. Oh boy. Let me see. I. Uh, or what the heck? It pairs. I I apologize if I'm butchering your name. I don't know how I'm supposed to uh, pronounce that. Or I fares. Uh, but thank you for the follow. I appreciate it. All the same. Um, so let's uh, let's go through this. So we've got it just works. So in other words, if I just plop this down on the table, oh my goodness, I land. Thank you for the follow. Wow. Thank you guys for all the follows. I really appreciate it. Um, so we've got it just works again this is it it'll just work out of the book i don't need to really work with the player to make this work at all um and this what i mean by that will probably become more apparent as we kind of start ranking the different um the uh the different roles here um but essentially it's like does this require me as a gm to prepare anything for the player for their role to do what it does and inter like interact with it um, then we've got requires a little bit of GM work. In other words, during what I prep for a session, do I need to prep with the role in mind? Um, and if I do, how much effort is it? So that's really what defines these next two tiers. So the first is going to be requires a little bit of work on my part. So maybe I need to prepare like a couple of numbers or something or consider it when I'm like placing NPCs. The second one requires a lot of work. This would be things. Uh, like I'll, I'll spoil the lead a little bit here. So this would be things like, uh, net architectures where I need to consider like, Hey, what's in the building, what can be connected to a network, all of that. 
It requires a lot of work on my part to like justify why all of it's there. Um, and then we've got the final tier, which I call Lawman tier, because uh, let's start with that one. The Lawman is the only one who lives in this tier. So allow me to explain why. <laughs> because I feel like there's going to be people that see this on uh that see this on youtube later and if those of you are watching this on youtube want to give your opinion down below in the comments i am open to hearing your uh take on this but this this goes back to a video john john the wise released maybe i want to say it might have been three months ago now um where he gave a like uh retrospective on what cyberpunk red was and like how he thought everything worked um some of his takes in that video i agreed with uh many of them i was a little bit more mixed on or i just straight did not agree with um but one of the takes of his that i like a hundred percent the more i've thought about it and discussed it with people that i agree with it's that lawmen are kind of in a weird place for roles um because on one part their role ability is pretty straightforward right their role ability is like you roll a d10 and if you roll equal to or less than their backup rank they get uh squad mates brought in in d6 rounds which like on paper that on its own sounds fine and that's how i ran it during the boot camp because i wasn't going to do any massive roll overhauls during the boot camp because that would defeat its purpose i think however with that said lawmen are their rollability is not as impactful as any other rollability on this list um the rollability goes from being potentially very impactful to being like almost not impactful at all and it's entirely dependent on the dice roll as to how impactful it, it becomes. Whereas if you compare that to something like a, let's say a media or a rocker boy or um, how like, let's really get in there and let's compare it to a solo. Are you telling me that for those of you who play or GM the game, you would play if you're looking at just the numbers, right? Like. The roles are more than numbers. We, we kind of all have to understand that is the roles are what you are on the street. But are you telling me that you would play uh, that you would play a solo over a lawman, right? Or other way, would you play a lawman over a solo? Like, because like the solo has stuff that makes their combat better. They have a ton of things that like lend to them doing their role better but the lawman really doesn't and that's they're kind of the only role in the game that that stands true for right like medias you could kind of argue and netrunners you could kind of argue are similar in that sense where they their role ability doesn't really center on any like one skill or anything um but they fit their identity and the net runner opens up a whole side of the gameplay that you don't see without them. Um, whereas a lawman, it's like, okay, I get a couple of dudes that show up and they may or may not show up, right? Or by the time they show up, because combat moves so fast in this game, 90% of the time, that unless you're up against something like a cyber psycho, they will not arrive on time for the combat. It will be over long before they show up um and that's a problem right uh lawman is essentially a summoner class see i don't even agree with that though i think that that's more what an exec is if i were to be honest i think exec is more like a summoner where you kind of like have a couple of extra mooks tied to you at all times and if you need something they're there to you know do those things if we're looking strictly at like the the game mechanic function i would argue exact would be far more that way so yeah so that's why i put lawman in its own tier because i think that it requires some discussion at each table 
as to how the GM is going to handle it. Are they going to handle it rules as written? Because like if you were a GM, so if we were being, you know, fair and just ignoring lawmen's here as a thing, and I was rating it solely on how it's written in the book, I'd probably just rate it up here because it doesn't really require any intervention from the GM outside of role playing the mooks that show up. But if we're talking about like making it as impactful as some of the other roles, I'd put it here. Because it's really like if you want to make it more impactful. So me and a friend were discussing how you might do that as a GM. And what we came up with was like either you do like a forked progression like um, med tech or a tech does. And you give it like a uh, like a sociopolitical side where you add like social role stat stuff to their role ability or allow them to use the role ability as a benefit, you know, if if as like an extra modifier in the same way that like techs get to use it with their field expertise, right? You you let them add it on to like their persuasion or their conversation or interrogation. Um, you, you make them more effective at negotiating um, when it comes down to like their cool stat and make them very cool stat oriented so that they are muscle, yes, but they also have to take points in cool to take advantage of that. Um, Lom is such an RNG heavy ability uh, that it, cause, uh, it causes it to be hard for fresh beat cops to get help. Yeah, it really does. And while I get that that's kind of like that's kind of flavorful in its own right. The fact that they only get to feel cool some of the time when there's their help arrives versus like a solo getting to feel cool all the time because they just get their points. It's very skewed. Um, and I just I have a really, really hard time considering why I wouldn't just play a solo and give them points in like criminology and stuff. And I just have a better lawman, right? Like, yeah, I wouldn't have my backup to call for, but then I just get trauma team or something. And then I kind of do. And then trauma team will come. It's not even a matter of if they'll come, it's they will come when I call in the same time that a lawman's backup might come, right? And they won't ask questions about it after either, right? As long as there was a patient for them to come save and extract, like, Trauma team is just better than the lawman's backup ability. So I think that that's a problem. So I think that that's like, if you're a serious GM who's been around the game a while, you'll know that this is more of an issue. I, I don't necessarily think that any new GM getting into the game should bother trying to fix the problem. Because I think when you're a new GM, your players, especially if they're also new, are probably not going to think about it that hard. It's it As the saying goes, it just ain't that deep. Um, but I think if you're looking to expand on what makes a lawman feel good, like, why would I play a lawman? They already are not well aligned to be an edge runner. They're not well aligned as far as the role ability to feel special. So I'm always going to be the bad guy in a group of people who are bending the law. I'm always going to be the bad guy to the actual bad guys. So like, who's on my side in that? At least the exec has their teamwork. So it's like, they're in a weird spot. So yeah, so they're lawmen here, so I don't have to worry about answering that question for you all here. Cause I, they are really, it's a hard split between these two, depending on like, or even all three of these. Cause you could realistically as a GM, you know, house rule it so that, you know, if you go beyond rules as written, it gets to be down here or here, like really, really easy. So yeah, so that's my lawman rant out of the way. Uh, Lawman makes for a complimentary role. Yeah, like it it can, right? Like if you are a solo and then take ranks in Lawman, I could see that. That would make more sense to me. But you almost have to like, almost like, unlike any other role in the game, Lawman is the only one that to me feels like you need to multi-class with it for it to be interesting. Whereas like, I could play a solo and the solo works. I could play a Netrunner, the Netrunner works. Like you can say for pretty much every other role in the game, I play this and to some extent it works, right? It just does what it's supposed to. And I don't need to feel, I don't need to do extra things or take extra roles to make my role feel good or special. Um, so that's, 
if if I were to ask one thing, because I know some people at our Talsorian Games do watch my videos on occasion, RTG, uh, if if I were to make one ask, it's that the lawmen receive some supplemental rules in the same way that nomads did in Black Chrome. If they got some kind of upgrade to their roll ability the same way that like nomads did, um, I mean, hell, in Black Chrome, even like Texan fixers technically got like, I wouldn't call it a buff, but a clarification slash adjustment to their role and that we now have codified rules for how easy or difficult it is to find something when we go looking for it, if it's beyond our normal abilities to do so. Like that would be helpful. I think having an extra bit of stuff that the lawmen can do um, that define their role as a authority just a little better, I would I would love to see it. I would really love to see it. Um, Lawman buff would be great. I agree, Diamond. So now that that's out of the way, let's go through the tier list. So I'll just go left to right here for the remaining roles. So we got media next. So media. Media is kind of in between these. I'm going to say... I'm going to say we'll put it on the low end of this tier. So it's because it's kind of in between these. There's like a halfway point between these that this kind of fills. Because medias as written, they don't do a lot, right? Like it's not like you have to memorize a long, complicated list of stuff to GM a media. Um, yeah, a little work as long as you prepare as needed. But see, Diamond, that's what I'm talking about is like, well, how do we define prepare as needed, right? In my opinion, um, if you want a media to feel their best, right, you'll put a lot of work into prepping what they're gonna find. But if even if you put in a little work, these guys end up feeling pretty cool. So we'll, we'll say that as a minimum, you need to put in a little work at, at the bare minimum. If, if I were saying, like, if I were to want as a GM to go above and beyond for the role, I, I would put them down here because I really think that their, their role ability makes them one of the more interesting roles in the game because of the way that they can develop over a long campaign, provided they stay alive long enough. Um, and that's solely because they really can, like, reshape the city. Like, I had a media during the boot camp. So, story time about the boot camp. One of the medias I had during the boot camp arranged a whole scheme to solve, to an extent, some of the food crises around the city. Um, we played through Vendit Heist. And uh, those of you who are watching this and you, you don't know what Vendit Heist is, uh, it is a game uh, or a module I wrote Um which is available on, I believe I put it up on my Patreon. If I didn't though, it's absolutely gonna be in the How to GM videos about writing your own gig, which is like the first three episodes of, of that playlist. So if you are interested in jamming the game or you GM it already and you haven't watched those, highly recommend it. Um, but it is linked in there. So if you wanna read over what Vendit Heist is, uh, you could see what it is. But the, the basic premise is this. Um, a bunch of vendits have gone missing from a uh, from a bodega at the edge of South Knight City in the University District. Um, and Continental wants the players to find out what's happening and bring the guy who's stolen them all to justice. Um, and the crew finds the guy during when I ran this in the boot camp. They find the guy. And they find the husks of all these vendits he's stolen as he's torn them apart. And uh, Tito, yeah, 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 yeah. Tito was part of it. So um, that session, was, I, I agree. The session was amazing. You guys, I mean, it, and it was uh, in large part due to you guys uh, because you guys came up with some really creative solutions, which is exactly what I want to talk about. So um, they find this guy with all these half torn up apart vendits, right? And they say, well, what if we pull one over on the corporation, we sell them back the data on how to fix their security in these vendits that this guy exploited, but we keep the vendits he's stolen and redistribute them 
to the combat zones throughout the city and solve a food crisis. And I'm like, that's a genius idea, right? And so through that, like through his gathering of resources and stuff, um, he was able to do that, right? And like, you could make the argument, like this is one of the arguments John Jai made against the media role that I don't quite agree with. Um, John John said like any social role can do the same thing that a media can. But my argument to the contrary is this. A media is all about networked knowledge, right? And it's not like for their own self benefit for the most part, right? Like obviously they need to get paid, but it's not for their own benefit 90% of the time. It's to spread word about something, especially if you're an edge runner media. If you're an edge runner, that's a media, you are a like combat media. You're not gonna be just doing fluff pieces on, oh, look at the little dog. We saved it from certain death. Oh, it's so cute. For those of you who don't live in Arizona, that's our evening news when they don't want to talk about something that is important. They'll put on the happy dog story. Uh, like, look at the little dog. It's so happy. Here's the story. He was saved. Oh, so happy. When there's more like substantive things going on in the world, that that's their cover for not talking about the substantive stuff. So the media edge runners are not going to be doing that. They're, they're going to be telling real stories about real stuff. So seeing that network of knowledge and that like locus of information that they have, the sources they've access to, my argument would be their role makes them more suited to that kind of working out. Um, these can send shockwaves through their community. Absolutely, Diamond. 110%. They can reshape the whole face of the city full stop. So this is why I say like, if you are a grade A GM doing what like your absolute best work, my argument was if you know you're GMing for a media, you're gonna put in a lot of work to make sure that what the media gets is substantive. And you could still make it relevant to like the campaign or the story you're trying to tell, but like you're, you're gonna be putting effort in. You've got to put effort in. There's like no way around it. Um, next, let's talk the exec. So the exec, um, I put him here. Um, so the exec is, uh, for those of you who came from Diamond's game, that's what I'm playing in uh, in this week's game. I'll be playing a Netrunner next week's. Uh, for those of you who are part of my community who showed up to her game and were like, well, gee, Emeron's not doing any net running. That's why, because I got my weeks mixed up. The boot camp threw me off. Um, it's also why I angrily still have not opened this box of yellow cards that I've had sitting on me for the last three weeks. Um, but <laughs> that tangent aside, um, execs don't require a ton of work by the GM. Um, they require a little bit of work, but pretty much all that they do is they get a backup person of some kind and the player gets to choose which kind they want. They roll the stats. And then the sheet essentially gets handed to their GM and their GM runs them. And then all the GM has to keep track of is what the exec is asking their help to do. Has the exec like praised their help? Has their exec, you know, like paid the, the help, um, you know, and like tracking the loyalty is like all the GM really needs to do. So it requires a little bit of input by the GM, but it's relatively minor. They just, their extra person becomes help in the scenario. Yeah, exec isn't terribly tough. Um, now, finding a reason why your exec might be going with the party, that might be something where you need to talk with your player and work, do a little work on that part. But once the exec's going, it's really not hard. Like the GM, the most of the GMs work with an exec comes in at the beginning when they're their player just comes to them and says, yeah, I want to be this. And it's like, okay, cool. You want to be an exec. I like, how are you fitting in with the edge runner campaign or running? Or you run a campaign specifically where execs are more the, the um, role of choice, right? So yeah, pretty easy. Um, pretty pretty uh, low effort on the GM's part. Our, our next one, Rocker Boy, is going to go in the same category. Um, so the cool thing about Rocker Boys is that they almost work out of the box without almost any GM intervention because they do have the power to turn people who are not their fan into a fan uh, by, you know, like 
standing on the street corner and be like, hey, Chumba, buy my CD. And I know there's a deck box, but just work with the fiction, okay? Chumba, buy my buy my CD. Or better yet, I actually have a Star Set CD here. Yeah, buy, buy my album, Chumba, like here, to, to take it. And like you can turn that like street pitch into um, a new fan potentially, right? And then all of your other role abilities work on that fan from that point on, right? Um, part of this where the GM kind of gets involved is figuring out like how widespread a rocker boy's notoriety goes when it comes to like building them fans in a scene so that they can take advantage of their ability and that more like widespread uh, kind of appeal stuff. Um, they figure out kind of where that all fits in, right? Um, so yeah, that's where I say Rocker Boy, they require a little bit of work. You have to think a little bit ahead, uh, but I'd argue not nearly as much as you probably absolutely should for the media. Um, even if you're doing your A game, Rocker Boy isn't really that hard because for the Rocker Boy, it's more about they are doing social stuff for immediate effect, whereas the media's is like a long-term one. So you have to plan a lot more long-term with the media for them to feel effective. Whereas with the Rocker Boy, as long as you planned it out to like one or two gigs ahead, you're pretty much okay with them. All right, so next up, we've got what could easily be mistaken for a Netrunner. This is our Fixer. So for Fixers, they're kind of tricky. I that that was a misclick. Um, they're kind of tricky. Um, let me just snooze an ad here real quick. So I I am leaned. So GM. So Diamond. Uh, since you're a GM and you're in my chat, fixers I think with their rollability are almost like they just work. Um, there's their like economic effect in the game very much on this level if you expand their rollability just a little bit because part of it is like who they know in the city you might get down to here because like this just is one of those things where like you know you you do require just a little bit of gm work um to like really make that part of their ability feel impactful but that could be as easy as, you know, like rolling on the friends and enemies table and like seeing, you know, if you know what the disposition of each of the people on the list is to them. And then it, it literally goes like this, you know, um, they work for the most occasionally a little prep. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm thinking, too. So they, they're kind of like if I'm positioning this, I'd say like this. Um, yeah, so far this is ordered correctly in terms of like, if you're on the left side here, you require the least amount of work. I'd say like, this would probably be where I put them. Solo, I don't even really need to worry about talking about this too much. Their point system just works. It's passives all the way down. You know, either they work uh, by making their uh, combat, uh, combat checks uh, unable to critical fail. They get bonuses to damage. They get bonuses to rolls. It just works. Like you literally don't need to prep anything for a solo at all, ever. Uh, let's see. Uh, societal danger, only problem with fixers is why they'd be going on the job. Everything else fits in fairly naturally. Yeah, I agree. They require kind of the same sort of ideas like the exec where it's like, why are you going out and risking your own ass? Um, the way I've always explained that is there's a food chain and it's kind of like, you know, if those of you who are coming from Diamond's game tonight, um, the gig was uh, the most powerful fixer in Night City got a car stolen from him. And you're the ones who are tasked with figuring that shit out. Um, that's terrifying. And I think every fixer knows their place in the, the food chain, right? So I've always explained fixers in that context, right? Like there is a fixer that that fixer goes to when they can't find something. And then that higher rank fixer is the one that your players will deal directly with from that point on. Um, so that's kind of where I'd say, yeah, like they probably require just a little bit of GM work from, from some of those angles. Overall, pretty easy. Um, nomads, unsurprising. They do just work. Um, 
Their moto ability is a skill bonus and it gives them cars and they get upgrades. Really easy. As long as your players have the resources like Black Chrome to look through, um, this thing works out of the box, out of the book, exactly like it should. Um, really nothing to say about it. Um, next, let's talk about Netrunner. So Netrunner, Netrunner is definitely in one of these tiers because on one hand, mechanically, they do just work. Their system just works. But what they use that skill on is where the GM prep needs to get involved. Um, I'd say probably, probably they'd end up here if I had to be honest, because the games I run when there is, I know there's no Netrunner present that cuts down like a quarter of the prep that I need to do. Cause like a quarter of the thinking I do when I do have a Netrunner is what's the architecture look like in the building. You have to think of what's defending it. How big is it? Um, how many eddies did the corporation or organization that owns the place? How much did they spend on it? How much do they have to spend? On and on and on. So like, this is like a quarter of my prep when I know a Netrunner is involved. Um, and I try to do my due diligence when I write gigs to write the networks into my gig. But sometimes I will go back if I'm planning on publishing them and I will, um, I'll add that after. Uh, for the sole reason that if I don't do it that way, I would not have as firm of a gig to like just run. But yeah, so that's where I say like Netrunner, if you use, there are some resources that can make this easier for a Netrunner. Some of those resources are things like um, in the single shot pack, like this should just be my whole screen. So I should be able to pull up the single shot pack for you all. Give me three seconds because I should have it open. Yeah, cool. So let me pull this onto my screen really quick because uh, it's down near the bottom here. Yeah. So for those of you who didn't know, those GMs out there that didn't know, the back of the book here uh, for the single shot pack, and this is free on the RTG website. So um, this is why I'm able to show you all this on stream because you can go download this for free right now. Um, these have example net architectures in the back, right? <clears throat> and these express like how expensive they are. This talks about how many, you know, like obviously how many floors they are, what demons they have installed. But this gives you an idea of like, if you're planning a net dive for your party, how deep some of this should be, right? And how expensive they should be. Um, so this is a nice starting point. If you combine like this, with the template in the core rulebook, because the net running chapter has like, I want to say it's like the back half of it, just about has information on in-place defenses and building net architectures. If you refer to this uh, when you do that, um, it'll help you make sense of all of that. But yeah, if you use like single shot pack and the core rulebook as guidelines, especially when you're trying to evaluate like how prepped is a net runner for like dealing with the consequences, how high risk do you want it to be for them? You'll probably do fine if you do that, but it will require you understanding that. Once you're more familiar with the system, like if you played a Netrunner or GM for one for a long enough time, this probably comes down to about here where you just have to think a little bit. Like I've made net arches on the fly when I've been GMing, um, when an NPC Netrunner gets involved. And like, I've had people ask me on Neon Inferno, like the last couple weeks, the party has been working with a, whoops, my chair lock disengaged. Um, I've had my party on Neon Inferno ask me the last couple weeks since they've had an NPC Netrunner helping them like, hey, did you just come up with like a net architecture that would she be running through and like the, the challenges she'd encounter on the fly? And I'm like, yeah, I did. And they're like, and you just like GM rolled through it. I'm like, yeah, I did. Cause like you, you, kind of begin to memorize the stats of certain things, right? Like hellhounds are pretty easy to remember what they all, like all their stats are what they do. Um, your average net runner, you know, you'll, you'll probably have a reference sheet of all the stuff they've got and like you'll know kind of what it does. So yeah, all of this becomes very second nature. I'd say once you've done it long enough, but until then it's gonna be on this tier for you. Um, and I would almost argue like if you're, again, doing your full due diligence as a GM, 
you'll probably do this, right? You'll spend more time on it. Um, the next two roles, like let's talk about first med tech. Med tech more or less just works. Uh, it might require a little tracking on your part as the GM um, to determine like what they've got or like to remember what pharmaceuticals they can make and all of that. Um, we have an ad break in like 30 seconds here. So I'll, you know, be happy to talk with you all for a little bit when that starts. But bottom line, MedTech mostly works out of the box. Their ability is explaining the core rules. You don't really need to haggle against that too hard. Um, but yeah, that they more, more or less just work. The tech. I would say the tech probably fits in like here, I'd say. Um, and the sole reason why I'd kind of fit them up here, eh, I'd probably say here, actually. Because they require more work than an exec, but mm, they're in a weird spot. These guys are in a really, really weird spot. Um, and the only reason I say they're in a weird spot is because they require enough work when they need to invent stuff. If you're dealing with like a tech that doesn't focus on inventing new stuff and just fabricating existing stuff or um, like their field expertise where it's just a static bonus to their role, those techs are gonna be here. The techs that focus heavily on invention, they are literally gonna be here. Um, so like as a happy medium to account for both kinds of techs, I'm gonna say, this would be where you'd stick them if you were to, you know, say like this accounts for, for all different styles of tech. Um, but they are probably one that you'll need to work on like a little bit uh, if they start inventing. And game balance always becomes an issue. They're the only ones in the entire game that completely upend balance potentially. So you have to bear, kind of bear that in mind um, when it comes to what they do. Um, but yeah, that's kind of bottom line. That's that's what, uh, what I think. So if you uh, agree with this tier list, uh, you know, awesome. If you disagree, I'd love to hear why. Um, those of you who are uh, in chat, if you have any disagreements with this tier list, I'd love to hear them now. I can then maybe read them for, for YouTube here. Thank you to my patrons for the month of February 2024. Your support makes doing what I do easier and allows me to do more with the time that I have. Thank you all so much. If you would like to support me in what I do, please join these fine people by following the link in the description below. Now back to the video. Thank you all. If uh, no one has anything to say about this tier list, um, let's go ahead and talk through, um, let's go ahead, I'm gonna make, let me see, this is just their homepage. Uh, I'm gonna make a new tier list now and we're gonna talk about uh, if you are a new player. So this is talking more about the GMs, right? Like this is, you are a GM, how much effort are you going to need to put in to your players for prepping for them based on the role that they're playing? Now let's talk about if you're a player coming to the game and we're going to talk to, again, strictly rules as written. We're not going to go way off the beaten path in terms of like how easy or difficult it is uh, if we home rule things like the lawman. We're just going to assume their backup works as it does in the core rulebook. That way we have like a flat line to work with when we're considering some of that. Um, so let me reset the tier list here. There we go. All right, so let's name these tiers. So the first one is, uh, we're gonna be talking, come on, don't keep doing that. I wanna rename this. So we're gonna super easy to understand. I'm actually good, that, that capital E is gonna bother me. Super easy to understand. Like if you're a brand new player and you're like, I want the easiest class or role in the game. Give me the easy one. 
I want to do that. We're gonna we're gonna rank them here. I'm gonna say super easy to understand. And uh, here, let me let me move my face real quick. There we go, much better. All right, I'll move my face down here. That way, we can, it's easier to see the tier list. Um, yeah, let me go ahead and relock that, and then I'll just scroll down here a little bit. Awesome, there we go. Makes it a little easier to see up there. Um, all right, so we got super easy to understand. The next one we're gonna say, um, uh, requires some understanding of the rules. Um, so we're gonna do that just so we can fit it all on one line. Yep, some reading of the rules. So these are gonna be rules that require you to like understand some of the basics of the game before you just dive full send into them. Um, next, whoop, come on. Next up, uh, we've got um, requires a thorough understanding or thorough reading reading of the rules. So this is going to be the ones that we really need to like read deep to like really understand like kind of what's possible with them. And then we're going to have down here um, has their own mini game within the game. In other words, if you're running these roles, they are their own thing. And I'm just going to delete that row because I think this this should let us encompass them pretty granularly. Um, so super easy to understand. Let's start with with which of the roles is super easy to understand. I think if you're playing them, even as a first timer, you're probably not going to have an issue with solos. Solos are very easy to understand, in my opinion. Again, all of this is my opinion. You can agree with it. You don't need to agree with it. Uh, but I think solos are very easy to get uh, an understanding for because all their skills do is reference other things like other skills or situations or whatever, right? Working numbers, very easy to understand. If you're a solo and you're a first timer, you're probably gonna have a good time. Like the hard part is, you know, understanding what every single thing under combat awareness means. But other than that, it's like, once you've got that figured out or if you have a cheat sheet next to you, this is a no brainer, it's super easy. And all you gotta do is remember to add the extra points to your sheet. Um, next, um, on the super easy to understand, Lawmen. Lawmen are really easy to understand rules as written because their ability, and this is literally both a good and a bad thing for them, is incredibly simple. Roll a die. If you get equal to or less than your rank, you summon something. And then whatever you summon is, you know, dependent on that same roll ability rank. Super easy, easy to understand, easy to use. The problem is it's not particularly effective, but we're leaving that aside. Again, this is just for players. Lawmen are easy to play. They just might not be easy to fit into a party of edge runners because you need a reason why they are there. So we're gonna go down to the next tier. We might, you know, reassess this later, but I think these two are like the easiest ones in the game to really understand and, and get behind. So the next up is requires us uh, some reading of the rules. So I think exec probably is an easy one to kind of fit into here. They're kind of between these tiers, if if I'm being honest. I don't think they necessarily have their own mini game, but they absolutely could require some more thorough reading of the rules to make smart choices. Um, however, I think to play them, you just really need to read some level of the rules to understand like what your choices are nomad is another one that just requires some reading of the rules uh, or were you saying um danger were you saying that that they're super easy to understand or some reading of the rules because i think nomad falls on this tier more than it does the top tier 
I, I think that this this is definitely one super easy. See, I'm mixed on that. I don't actually know that I agree. Uh, and I only say that because you have so many choices that I know like when I'm a new TTRPG player playing a system for the first time, if I am going to pick a role to play, I don't want to be bogged down by a million choices. And what Nomad represents is a lot of choices. You have a lot of different decisions you can make because you have to understand like, okay, if I pick a standalone vehicle that I customize myself, what do each of these options mean? Uh, do I have the skills to use some of these options? Like, do I have enough shoulder arms to use a flamethrower? Do I have enough uh, budget in my, in my character to like supply the ammo for onboard machine guns? Things like that. Like they require a basic understanding of the rules before you play them, in my opinion. Once you have them rolled, they're very easy to play. But rolling one custom, you do need to have some reading of the rules and it's going to require you flipping back and forth between books, especially if you're using a black chrome vehicle. So if you're using a black chrome vehicle, then you need to reference the core rule book, see like what does, for example, like an armored chassis do versus a heavy chassis, right? Like I, as a GM who's played the game for a couple of years, know what that means. And I know the difference, but does your new player know the difference? And that's where it does require a little reading. So I'm not saying they're hard to play, but they are something you need to kind of look at the rules and read up a little on them. And I think it's about the same for an exec, right? Like you need to understand, you know, that's fair. I was thinking more about actual play than rolling them up. Yeah. And that, that's kind of what I mean. Like if you roll one of these, you're going to be able to like roll and you go, right? Like, cause this doesn't have any choices of character creation. Neither does this. This one has one choice of character creation in terms of like what backup person you're going to pick. And you need to understand the rules to a certain extent to pick that well for your idea of the character, your corporation you're a part of. Nomad in the same way, you have to think about it when you make your character, like is the vehicle I wanna be in gonna work with my character as well? Cause otherwise you're gonna get what I got the first time I played a net runner and I didn't give them much handgun skill. And you're gonna be disappointed constantly when a firefight opens up cause you can't do anything because you didn't build them that way. And that's what we want to avoid as GMs for our players. So yeah, I'd say reading some of the rules, it's a good idea. And I did see, yeah, you know, that's fair. Yeah, like that's why I think that. Um, So some reading of the rules. Do any of these others really qualify that? Probably med tech. I'd say med tech. Eh. You know what? No. Let me, let me keep med tech for later. Cause I got some, I played med tech's my secondary, like that I play a lot. Um, so I, I know med tech quite well and they're kind of, they're kind of, they're kind of here. If I was going to say anything, they're kind of here. And the only reason that I put them that far down the tier list here is because number one, you've got choices to make a character creation in terms of like, what kind of a med tech are you? Are you crowd systems tech? Are you surgical tech? Are you a pharmaceuticals tech? Um, so again, we have that character creation choice. You've got to choose a thing, right? A discipline. And it's not something you can change later. So that is a secondary that I want to add on to this. Is it's a choice and you can't change it, right? If it's a choice that I can change, this is where those kinds of roles or this is where those kind of roles kind of sit. If I can change my choice later, it's not going to hurt me too bad right now to pick one thing and, and go back on it later. But if I can't change and it fundamentally affects how well my role can help the party, this is what we're looking at. And if I pick a bad pharmaceutical, then I'm in trouble because then that's all I can synthesize until I get another role ability. And that's like six, or potentially seven gigs off of where I started, right? Um, and to an extent, these guys kind of have their own mini game within the game, but it's kind of, it's just a series of normal skill checks um, that is just like a table. 
Because I think of like how you fix critical injuries and stuff, and that's kind of a mini game, but it's kind of not. So we'll we'll sit them here. It's a happy medium, I think, between most of the options that we have available. Um, next up, we're going to go for... Because honestly, yeah, I think these are the ones that, if I were to say, like, requires some reading of the rules, this is probably the ones... No, you know, we'll add Rocker Boy to it. We'll add Rocker Boy to it. And the reason I'm adding Rocker Boy up here is because your rollability is pretty straightforward. Um, you don't need to read too hard to understand, like, this is what you do. Um, you're probably going to want to understand some of the rules around social checks and things to make sure you get the most out of your character and their skill set and what their role in the party is. But it's probably not too complicated. You'll probably figure it out pretty quick, even if you're a newer player. Um, I, I'd say that, you know, come on. There we go. Do that. Yeah, because they're probably at, like the top of this. Require some light reading of the rules to understand like this is what you do, but it's nothing crazy, right? Um, thorough reading of the rule stuff. Fixer. We're going to put a fixer in here because in my opinion, uh, again, the hardest part of the game for me when I was a new GM was figuring out how the hell the economy worked and why the economy was such an important part of the game. Now as an experienced GM, I can tell you with certainty, like the economy is quite honestly, in my opinion, probably the most important aspect of the game. And so if your player is running a role that interacts with it, they are gonna wanna have a pretty thorough understanding of the rules to understand what they're capable of. Um, because fixers can, make deals with all kinds of different people. Um, they don't quite have their own mini game, but they absolutely have a set of skills that only they can do. And if the players don't really understand what that looks like, um, they aren't going to get the most out of this character when they're playing them. Like making one super easy. You can make a fixer super easy, uh, but making them work well for you, uh, picking the right skills and stuff. You probably want to understand those rules pretty well and by extension, understand your place in the world um, pretty well. Next, let's talk about the last three. Let's throw a mini game, more of their own side hustle. Exactly. So now, now we're coming to the last category. So I'll give you how I order these personally uh, and in terms of like, how much I think you need to understand to play them well. Um, again, this is just my opinion. Any of you new players watching this, either live with me right now or later on YouTube when I post this there. This is not meant to intimidate you from playing any of these roles, because I think at least two of these roles, in my opinion, are ones I would recommend highly, even to new players. Um, just because of what I seen them do. And if you're a really creative player, you probably won't have any trouble dealing with these. Uh, but they do require you understanding pretty deeply what your deal is, right? So in order from easiest to most difficult to understand, I'd say here, here, here. That is how I would rank that. So let's go through them one by one in that order. So first we've got media. Media has their own little mini game in terms of they've got rumors, they've got their stories, and they've got the ways that they affect the city that are a lot less clear cut. Uh, they're a lot less well defined. Um, and they have to have a goal in mind when they're kind of starting a piece, right? And everything that they do is in service of that story and the goal behind it. And if you're a player who doesn't really understand what uh, you're doing that's maybe going to be a little more difficult. The mini game itself is very straightforward where you're only really rolling a couple of die and seeing like how it compares to your rollability. But it's the thing you're doing underneath the rolls that make this more complicated. And I'd say of like probably the three rolls here, this is the one that is like 
probably the hardest to figure out. I know certainly, so actually I might put them at the end here. So we'll go backwards. Because this might be the hardest one to understand on a larger scope level, but the easiest seeming to understand of these three from just looking at the rollability and what you do with it. So yeah, it's it's in a we really weird spot, but if you have like a really, like if you've got a solid mission statement behind like, this is what I want my media to do in the city or the world or whatever, they will lock in like right here. They'll probably be like right there. Um, next, uh, the, the next one below them I'd say is Netrunner. Now, Netrunner is my favorite role in the game. So I say this as a loving parent of a Netrunner character, multiple Netrunner characters actually, right? I run many Netrunners. I run NPC Netrunners. I love, love, love Netrunners, right? I'm gonna show you the table of contents real quick for the core rule book. And this will illustrate my point, I think, better than anything else that I could say. There is a whole chapter on net running. Media requires a mission and a long-term goal to be defined by the player more than any other role. Yes. So therefore they are a mini game. They are their own mini game, but they're a mini game that doesn't have clear cut rules, which makes them very challenging for a new player who's just catching the setting to like really wrap their head around, I think, if you don't have a good concept of what a media should do. But yeah, for Netrunners, we've got our own chapter in the book, right? And that alone here, this alone makes me go, hmm, that's interesting. We need a lot of information to do what we do. And this is literally all for just our role ability, right? Like you need to know this chapter in addition to this one for, for combat roles, right? If you, if you don't know this chapter in addition to this one, you're going to have one side or other of the character that's not going to be super well defined. Um, and that's going to be difficult. Trust me. This, this happened with my first Netrunner character. It is hard. Um, so yeah. Just to illustrate that, that's why I say Netrunner belongs here. They have their own chapter in the book. And I think for that alone, they deserve being on this tier. Finally, we come to techs. Now techs. Techs are really, really easy in one way and really, really complicated in another. So if you are a new player playing a tech and you're like, well, damn, I don't want to make my own shit. I don't want to like invent. I just want to do things. Well, then that's fine. Like you don't need to put any points into invention expertise because unlike the other roles here, uh, with the exception of the med tech tech kind of picks points into a forked, what I call a forked progression system. So when we're talking like what, Emeron, what the fuck is a uh, forked progression system? Allow me to explain with the magic of MS Paint. So when you got a character like a solo, right? So like over here, we have the circle for a, for a solo, right? So I'm just gonna real quick draw this out. So for a solo, we've got combat awareness, right? That is their role ability. And combat awareness is just kind of connected like six different ways to the various abilities. And they just say, okay, I'm going to like put four over here or they'll spread them out. So instead of four over there, you go like, I'm going to put like, you know, one in each of these four areas, right? And you could freely reassign that, right? So this isn't forked progression. This is like, this is a uh, layered progression for you. So you just get more points to put in here into the equation and you get more ways that you can use that by extension because you just have a larger pool to use, right? Uh, learning to set up and run net running was daunting. Back when I ran 2020, I didn't even bother. See 2020 net running, we, <laughs> 2020 net running my 
my friends, 2020 net running is a hard thing. It is because on one hand, the hack, uh, the hacking simulation gamer in me looks at 2020 net running. I'm like, damn, that looks so cool. And GM me looks at it and says, damn, I would not want to GM that, especially in a longer group. Like if I were in a wider group, I would literally find another time to have the cruise net runner, uh, like get into a system before they were on site and then, you know, let them know success or failure at their session on another day, because it is just so fucking much that the net runner in 2020 had to do that. The party had no effect on, um, and that sucks. Cause like, man. So let's talk forked progression now, right? So this is layered progression. So you have points, you have, you know, four points here that you just can put in any allocation you want. Forked progression is saying, I am, I am a tech, right? So here I am, I am a tech. I have four ranks when I start off. So this means I get eight points to spread among my various skills but these eight points cannot be reallocated so we've got four different directions these eight points can go and these cannot be changed later so on the first level we've got invention let me see i know there, there's there's got to be yeah there is a text thing i'm i'm just being stupid Bear with me one moment. I'm going to just erase this real quick because I'd rather type. All right. So here we have invention, right? So invention is the ability to create new stuff that doesn't yet exist. And this is why I would put G, uh, why I would put, um, these guys in this, this area, right? Uh, let me go back to home. Yeah, so this is why I put these guys in this area is invention, right? Their other three, though, are pretty self-explanatory because those are upgrade, which the rules largely define and it leaves a little wiggle room so that like if you have a tech and the tech's like, man, you know, GM, I really want to upgrade, uh, you know, this gun or armor to do this other thing that it doesn't do currently and isn't covered by the upgrades that are listed in the rule book but man this looks really cool and i want to do it you as the gm then can look at them and say okay tech you got it buddy you could do that or no you can't do that so this is kind of in the weird middle ground the last two though are very very straightforward we have uh so it's field expertise and uh and fabrication. So we'll start with fabrication because it's the one that uh, you'll probably see used most often if you've got a tech that isn't good at these other things. Um, so fabrication is quite simply, I'm a tech that wants to make stuff, right? Uh, yes, yeah, societal danger. Yeah, net running in 2020 is an entire game within a game. But yeah, so tech, uh, fabrication techs are just making stuff really easy to explain. And uh, if they aren't inventing stuff, it's really easy because they can only make stuff that's been invented. And then finally, we have field, a field tech or field expertise tech. So field expertise, what do it do? Uh, it is very simple what it do. Field expertise is just uh, all field expertise is, is a uh, bonus, essentially. Any of your tech based roles that you roll, you can get field expertise to it equal to this, the ranks in this one. So when you make a new tech, you have eight points and you have to evenly distribute them um, between at least two of these, right? So you can put four and four or you can do four, two, two, um, I believe. And so now that I've kind of explained the forked progression model, like this is kind of what that looks like. Um, let me go back to uh our let me go back to our uh single shot pack here real quick because this also explains something field expertise is how much duct tape you have honestly that's a great way to 
Adlock. Thank you. Don't care. Get out of here. Um, so let me go up to tech here real quick and I can explain kind of what I, yeah, here we go. Here we are. So yeah, so this, this explains what three of them do. Uh, cause these are the three it gives you, it does not give you invention expertise because shocker for one shot invention is one, not It's not going to matter because inventing something takes a lot of time. So for a one shot, it won't matter. Uh, but also for two, um, it's one of those things that you need to put a lot of time into when you do make stuff um, and a lot of money into it too, usually if you're making anything like more than like a hundred eddies. Um, so this describes kind of how you can upgrade stuff, the field expertise explained here and the fabrications here. Real simple. If it were only these abilities, if were only these abilities, the tech would be right here. Like, cause the, those abilities are easily explained or maybe at most like here. Cause those abilities are so easy. The moment you add invention into the mix, you're right down here. You got your own mini game. Um, there's a DLC actually funny enough. Let me, let me pull up this DLC here real quick. Let me uh, grab this for us. Cause if those of you who are GMs or if you're a tech and you're playing and you don't know, um, there's a DLC that Artal Sorian made especially for you, just about. This is Salvaging Night City. Those of you who have not seen my video on this, I have a uh, specific video on Salvaging Night City where I break this down. Uh, as far as I'm aware, I believe this is art that was originally made for this DLC. I don't know that this art appears anywhere else, which is kind of cool, right? Um, but this literally goes through all the ways you could salvage the rules on uh, what you're going to take out, the worth of it, the perils. So this is its this document is its own mini game, right? This is a whole extra downtime activity, and you really can only take advantage of this deeply if you are a tech. Um, if you're anything other than a tech, this is going to be maybe less useful to you because while you can go out and you can salvage and you can potentially get something valuable out of the scrap yards or whatever, um, you still need enough of a tech check to repair it. And if it's something that isn't super simple, you're going to probably not have the skills to do it. Whereas techs have field expertise, so they can fix all of this and it's much easier for them. So in all essence, salvaging night city is just like a tech DLC that you guys have access to. Um, and this is why I say this is a very good document for y'all to wrap your, your head around if you play a tech or have a tech at your table. And it's one more reason why I think they belong down here. So yeah, uh, chat. I know we've kind of talked through this one a little more, I feel like, than the last tier list. Did we have any further commentary? I will I will give a couple of moments here for commentary if any of you have some. Uh, do you feel like medtech can kind of all and now makes sense to me? Do you feel like medtech kind of sit in either middle category? It, it kind of can. I would say that any any uh, role that has forked progression that you can't renege on, you kind of need to put it into a more thorough reading of the rules, especially because like medtech is such layered forked progression. It's not just I choose one thing and can do that thing. It's okay. If I'm going to be a surgery tech, then I probably also want cyber tech so that I can fix the cyberware that I have, uh, you know, for the clients that I have. Um, and I need to like repair those things before I implant them. Um, so that requires, I understand that both surgery is what i need to do here with these and then i need to understand how that repair works if i'm pharmaceuticals i need to understand all the drug choices i can manufacture and what each does since we have hornets pharmacy now i can't pick all the drugs in the game by the time i'm ranked 10. Uh, even if all i do is put points into pharmaceuticals and surgery uh, or pharmaceuticals and crowd systems so by extension it makes me much more like I need to choose right. So I think it does require more thorough understanding of the rules.